Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today at this fantastic event. Thank you, Alex, and everyone for putting it on. Really impressive. So, yes, my pitch is that there is no planet B. We're not moving anywhere anytime soon, and we need to look after our own planet. So, what's happening to my clicker? Right. So, uh, as Alex mentioned, I'm a astrophysicist, I'm looking for planets that orbit stars beyond our solar system, beyond our own sun. And this is a field that uh, is very dynamic. We found the first exoplanets about 20, 25 years ago. And uh, since then, we found thousands of planets. And we know uh, from these observations that uh, planets orbiting stars uh, are extremely common. And in fact, basically every star should have planets. That's what we're expecting. Uh, and it's, well, it's something that we always expected, right? Humanity has always known it. But now we have the data. And so my clicker is definitely not working. <laughs> right. So Exeter, at Exeter, we're part of the terror hunting experiment. It's um, a, a multi-million pound investment uh, experiment where we're basically uh, going to have a telescope in uh, La Palma in Spain, and uh, we're going to, that's the telescope, that's the Isaac Newton telescope, and we're going to be looking at stars, a sm relatively small sample of stars, maybe 20 to 40 stars that are roughly si with similar properties to our own sun, and we're going to be looking for their wobbling that is induced by planets orbiting them. And the way, what's unique about this experiment is that we're going to be looking at these stars every night, every observable night, good weather night, for 10 years. And that's what you need to detect a one Earth mass planet in a one year orbit around a sun-like star. Okay, so uh, the goal is to find planets that have similar mass and similar surface temperatures as Earth. Are we going to find these planets? Are we going to find a planet like Earth? What do we mean by a planet like Earth? Before I jump into that, I want to show you, um, this is an artist impression of our galaxy. And uh, this is, we're down here, the sun, and that little blob is basically where most uh, discovered exoplanets have been found. Like the vast majority are in that little blob. So we've not looked at <laughs> the rest of the galaxy because it's actually really big. And, um, and basically from these observations, we can extrapolate out to the entire galaxy. But really, these are the types of planets that we're finding. This is where they are. There's also actually a cone that looks out. Do you know what mission discovered the planets in that little cone? Anybody? Yeah? Kepler. Yes, it's Kepler. So NASA's Kepler mission about 10 years ago uh, looked at um, basically a small part of the sky, and it looked much further. So we did find some planets that are further out, although they're less interesting because they're further away, so the stars are less bright, so we can find out less about the planets. Um, but anyway, so this is where we found where we know most exoplanets, and now you're probably thinking, oh, well, they're super close to us, actually. So let's just take a step back and you know, think about how far these planets are, because you're probably thinking in the back of your head, well, Rafi said there's no planet B, but Maybe there is, maybe we can go there. So how far are these planets? We're gonna look, um, pretend we're a photon traveling from the sun out at the speed of light. And this is our solar system. So how long would it take us to get to Earth? It's a photon, yeah? Eight minutes. Eight minutes, correct. What if we went to the edge of our solar system? Ballpark it. I'm an astrophysicist. You can just give me orders of magnitude. Hours, days, months. Hours. Hours. About 140 hours. What's our nearest star beyond the sun? Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri in the uh, system with same system as Proxima Centauri. Uh, how long would that take us as a particle of light? Four years, yeah, four light years. If we were to travel to Proxima Sen with um, the world's fastest spaceship, which is basically the New Horizons probe that recently got to Pluto, it would take us 79,000 years to get there. 
That's one way. Okay, so now you might say, well, you know, um, we'll just do these like generation spaceships and it'll be fine. Uh, and, and the majority of exoplanets that we've found, that red blob, uh, they're basically between 50 to 3,000 years away at the speed of light. So, you know, <laughs> four years, 80,000 years as humans, do the, do the maths. Uh, and, and you might still say, well, you know, that's, that's okay, we'll overcome that. And um, sure, in fact, I would argue that this is the least of our problems when we're looking for another planet to move to. But some of you might still say, well, you know, this is still showing us uh, that there is no planet B, at least a first order, right? It's going to be very difficult to get there. But the question is, is not how do we get there, is what do we do once we're there, right? And um, to answer this question, I want to look at, I want to show you what the data are telling us about how common these Earth-like planets are. Uh, so. Earth-like planets, what does that mean? This is the definition that was used in this uh, compilation of studies uh, by, uh, led by Ravi Koparaku and Eric Ebrard, who is an extra in the Astro Group. Uh, and they basically brought multiple teams across the world together to look at the data and apply their own analyses and look at how common planets are. And so their definition for Earth-like was uh, two things. So the planet has to be about the same size as Earth, so between a half to one times the size of Earth. And it has to be in this habitable zone, which is basically uh, the right distance, the Goldilocks zone from uh, the, the star. So the planet is just at that point where it receives between a third to all of the radiation, the, the solar heat, uh, the heat that we get from the sun on Earth. Okay. So this was a compilation of studies. On average, they found that one in five stars has one of these planets, a terrestrial temperate planet. And on the pessimistic side, they were like, okay, it's more like one in 10 stars. On the optimistic side, they were like, actually, all stars have at least one of these. So that might sound like a really wide range, right? You're thinking, well, <laughs> we're not really any further ahead because it could be between one in 10, like 10% or 100%. But when you think about it, this is a question that humanity has been wondering about for millennia, right? And for the first time in history, for the last 10, 20 years, we've actually been able to answer this question. And before that, we had no idea if it was one in a million, one in a trillion, all stars. And now we've got the data. So actually, this is a pretty good constraint, considering you know, we've only been starting to find these planets observationally for about 20 years. Right, so let's go for one in five stars has a temperate terrestrial planet. How many stars do we have in our galaxy? Ballpark. Billions. So we've got about, I'm going to take 300 billion. There's actually varying estimates. If you multiply 300 billion by one in five, you get about 60 billion Earth-like planets, so terrestrial temperate planets in our galaxy. This is the estimate that we're making. That's an incredible number, right? <laughs> and, um, well, we're thinking, wow, there, there must be another Earth in there, right? Surely. And we'll overcome how to get there. It will be fine. So the question is, you know, which one of those are we going to go to? And how are we going to figure out, you know, whether they are actually like Earth? And the answer is that we're not going to be characterizing all of every single one of these planets, right? Uh, we're only going to characterize a handful, a dozen, maybe a few hundreds. And we're going to get very basic properties out of them. But we actually have our own Earth. We do have a very well-known terrestrial temperate planet. So I want to now take you on a journey to look at our own Earth. We're going to zoom out. We're going to jump out into orbit and zoom out and look at what it looks like from space and contemplate our planet as though it were one of these 63 billion temperate terrestrial planets. So now we're on the ISS, the International Space Station. It's beautiful, eh? Uh, so this is a photo where you can see Earth's surface. 
you can see what makes it our home. You can recognize it immediately, right? You've got, um, well, you've got the solar panel from the, the space station, and then you've got, uh, you can see the continents, you've got land, you've got ocean with the glint from the sun. You can see that there's an atmosphere because you've got lots of clouds, weather is very dynamic. You can see the atmosphere actually, the very thin blanket that covers our planet, that protects us. And um, yeah, all these features that make Earth our home, that make it, you know, we look at it and, well, my heart warms up. Um, I'm, I'm sure yours do too. So at night also, the same, we're also on board the ISS. And uh, this is incredible. Again, you can see the atmosphere and you can see the impact of industrialized societies, right? This is uh, Rio de Janeiro and um, Sao Paulo. Let's go a little bit further to where humanity has been the furthest. We're on the moon now. And this time you can see all of Earth into one go, in one image. And you can still recognize it, right? You still have the clouds, you still have the oceans, the blue oceans, you, you can even see the land, right? It still looks like our home. Now, let's go to the edge of our solar system, so basically past Jupiter and Saturn. And this is where Voyager 2 was. And um, this is the Pelvue dot image. Uh, remember Carl Sagan advocated for Voyager 2 to turn back once it was out there to take a selfie of our own Earth. And this is where we are. So this is our, this is our planet now. This is one tenth of a pixel. <laughs> We've lost, this is a, a ray of sunlight, by the way, if you're wondering, it's just noise. And, and here we've lost all of the spatial information, right? We've just got a point of light and everything we know and love, as Carl, Sagan, as Carl Sagan said, is in that little point of light, right? And this is actually a really interesting kind of data for exoplanet astronomers because this is the most we're basically ever gonna get from an exoplanet. And so we're looking at Earth seen as a distant point-like planet, just as one of these billions of planets in the cosmos. So the question is, how do we extract information out of that point of light? And the answer, one of the best ways to do it really is to take, we, we don't have any spatial information, but we have information uh, based within the colors of the light. So astronomers take spectrographs. They basically have like high-tech prisms. They split the light into colors. And this is data that I'm showing you, uh, not of that point, but of a, an experiment that looks at Earth as a point as well. And we're looking at uh, amount of light, so the brightness, and as I said, we're splitting it amongst it, uh, uh, we're splitting the colors. So you've got visible light down here, and we're looking in the near infrared and the infrared. So actually, the first thing you see on this plot is that you have a lot of things going on. There's a lot going on on Earth. And I'm going to talk you through the main features. So the brightest part of, wow, it's not even, oh, no, there we go. The brightest part of our spectrum is actually in the blue. And that's Rayleigh scattering that happens in Earth's atmosphere. That's basically the sky's blue, so it looks blue. And that's why that image in the previous slide was called the pale blue dot because when you take a photo of Earth as a distant point-like planet, you basically see a blue dot because it's the brightest uh, feature in the spectrum, in the visible spectrum. Next, we actually have a lot of signatures of water. So this is, uh, I think, mostly water vapor from the atmosphere. And that basically immediately tells us, based on our definition of what a habitable planet is, that this planet that we're looking at is habitable. Makes sense, it is habitable for now. <laughs> then these other features are oxygen and methane. And the simultaneous presence of these two elements, of these two molecules, actually tells you that not only is Earth habitable, it is inhabited, it has life on it. Because these two molecules, you can't have them in an atmosphere at the same time. The atmosphere is in disequilibrium 
because if they were there at the same time, they'd just immediately re react with each other and produce um, carbon dioxide and water, I think. So, so the fact that they're there, that we see them in the spectrum, means that they're being produced constantly and they're being produced by life. So they're a biosignature. So Earth is inhabited, and we can see it on this observation of Earth as a distant planet. And then finally, um, if I had more time, I'd go more into this, but you also see uh, potentially this, um, this feature that's called the red edge that's caused by the chlorophyll that Simon was talking about. Uh, that's in, in plants, that makes plants green. You can see that's, actually no, that's in, in the near infrared, it's not in the green. Uh, it's due to the structure of plants. Uh, the, the, the chlorophyll has a given structure that enables photosynthesis. And so that's potentially another biosignature, although it's more difficult to observe. Really, if you're looking for life on other planets, you want to look for that disequilibrium, so you know, oxygen and methane together, for example. So that's our planet seen from afar. And you can see that life has a huge imprint in, on it. It's an integral part of what we're looking at. Life is an integral, you know, it's an astrophysical characteristic of our planet. If we're thinking about planets as people, Earth, planet Earth, has a strong, you know, life personality. And that's because Earth is a complex system. It can be viewed as a complex system wherein all of the different parts, so remember we were looking at, uh, we saw the oceans and the land and the atmosphere and the life that we saw as well, they all interact with each other. They're all part of a system and they evolved over billions of years together, right? I mean, life has been around for almost as long as Earth has been around for like three billion years. And they created these very complex intrinsic connections with each other that we know as feedback mechanisms. So for example, the carbon cycle, the, life, the, the water cycle. Uh, and, and that creates a complex system and the emergent property of that, uh, you can do very simple abstract models. It shows that the emerging property is that it, the system self-regulates. So in other words, this is what keeps Earth habitable. Life, keep, life plays a role in keeping it habitable for us. Um, very quickly, I want to say that we are part of Gaia too, right? We have an impact on this system, uh, which we call Gaia. And, uh, and we're, we're, as you know, we're having a very strong impact. So we can actually use that. Now that we're conscious of that, we can make our own changes, right? And one of the beautiful things about this hypothesis of Gaia is that we, every single one of us, is an agent of change. Right, so it's really empowering. And this is one of the, the founding um, ideas of the Global Systems Institute here at Exeter, and I encourage you to join it. You can sign up for the mailing list. We have a lot of really exciting events of all kinds, seminars and other workshops and stuff. Uh, and uh, yeah, join us. So the uh, corollary of this idea that the life is a complex system and um, you know all the parts interact with each other, is that to create a planet that is habitable, we need to have co-evolved with it over billions of years. Okay, so when we think about Mars, for example, or any other planet, basically, to make it habitable, you have to have these billions and billions of workers, those bacteria, all the life, working together, creating these deep connections in the ecosystem to make it uh, our home to make it what we want to, you know, the air we breathe and the ecosystem services that we get, all of that. So really, there really isn't a planet B. And that's really the main reason. Just going to finish up by saying that astronomy, as Simon actually was, uh, well, you talked about communication, and astronomy has this, like, awe-inspiring, you know, feature. And it's really a gateway to engage people on climate science. Uh, this is the pop-up that Extra Science Center had last year, and if you want to get involved, then uh, please do uh, become a volunteer. They're looking for volunteers. They're going to have another one in September, and uh, they just have a lot of events. It's really a lot of fun to work with them. So wrapping up, become a volunteer, sign up for the GSI, and uh, yeah, 
you know, be agents of change because there is no planet B.